to help get this presentation kicked off today. Thank you. I did this in honor of the Week. <laughs> I don't know it was that hard to uh, <laughs> function with integrity, but uh, Hope is a, uh, is a true trooper. Uh, and uh, got this uh, distress call this morning uh, that uh, she had uh, fallen, probably running out of the house so quickly uh, to uh, to get here. Please uh, give uh, Hope Caldwell a big, big round of applause. Uh, and uh, certainly her deputy, uh, our deputy integrity officer, Stephanie Tipton. Stephanie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Glad to uh, glad to be here. Sorry, I was running a little bit late, uh, but I was uh, out at a great, great business uh, of ours uh, in the city. They just had a big uh, ribbon cutting Alpha Office Supply, uh, which is a thirty-plus-year-old business. Um, and at one point in time, they were considering uh, the prospect just for expansion purposes and some other issues about uh, possibly moving out of the city. A couple years ago, we work with them very, very closely in PIDC. Uh, and the Commerce Department, and they have now uh, renovated some space over in the Business and Technology Center, 49th and Parkside Avenue, and turned it into a state-of-the-art uh, office supply company that can sell you everything uh, from the floor to the ceiling and all the stuff in between. And uh, they really, uh, they really have done a fantastic job. So we're excited, uh, excited about that. And uh, it was uh, slightly delayed. Um, this uh, kind of, I guess, yesterday that was the official. A start of Integrity Week. And even though I wasn't with you for the official start, I was acting with integrity yesterday uh, as well. Um, with that in mind, I certainly want to recognize right up front our, also our uh, Inspector General, uh, Amy Curlin, uh, who is a part of our overarching and overall team of in helping to ensure uh, integrity uh, in our city government. So please recognize Amy and the work that she's doing. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for attending this uh, first official uh, event uh, of uh, Integrity Week uh, for the City of Philadelphia. This is the first time we've hosted uh, such uh, a week known as Integrity Week. Uh, but we'd like to think, uh, and I know for a fact, that for about 99.9% uh, .9 of our public employees, every week uh, is Integrity Week. But it never hurts to have a reminder about some of the things that are going on. This week is really about the opportunity uh, to build awareness of our city's uh, public integrity laws, celebrate the strong ethical culture that we've been building, uh, but is never totally complete. You never stop uh, the focus uh, on these particular issues. It's not like uh, you know our great friends over at, uh, say, the Streets Department. You have a pothole, you fill the pothole, it at least stays filled for some period of time, and you kind of move on uh, to the next thing. Integrity is an every day, every minute, every hour, every week, all the time uh, kind of uh, activity. It's not just an event. It's an activity. It's a mindset uh, that uh, we really have to uh, uh, infuse uh, into not only all of our public employees, but the public as well. And so you'll hear me say from time to time, not only do we need our employees to act with integrity, but we need to stop the public uh, from trying to inappropriately influence our, our public employees. As I say, it uh, usually uh, takes uh, two to tango, and so we need to make sure that the public uh, is focused on what's right and wrong as well. Today's presentation is focused on our State Ethics Act and how it applies to all of us as city employees. We have our own uh, city laws, uh, and there are state uh, ethics laws that we must adhere to uh, as well. Uh, and in, in many instances, uh, some of our own rules uh, here at the local level, uh, in some instances, may in fact uh, be even more strict uh, than the overall uh, statewide uh, statutes that apply to everyone. 
fortunately, uh, the daily Integrity Week emails uh, that you will receive this week and the Integrity Works website uh, will add uh, to our collective uh, understanding. And today's presentation uh, will certainly help us to spot, uh, put the spotlight on uh, some issues as they arise. Today's discussion will be facilitated by uh, Brian Jasson. Jasson, relatively close. Uh, we don't want to say close enough for government work, so um, it's Jason, uh, the Deputy Executive Director and Director of Investigations for the State Ethics Commission. I want to recognize uh, the uh, Executive Director, although I know he could not be here, but we certainly know his name, those of us who kind of operate uh, in uh, this world. Robert Caruso, uh, who is the Executive Director of the State Ethics Commission, and since April of 2013, he is the uh, longest tenured commission employee starting his work in 1982. I want to thank both of them uh, for their work and certainly for Jason, uh, Brian rather, uh, coming here today. Let me introduce uh, Brian Jasonson, as Deputy Executive Director and Director of, of Investigations and Legal Counsel for the Ethics Commission. His duties are to provide legal advice and guidance uh, concerning ongoing investigations and to prosecute violators of the Ethics Act before the Ethics Commission. His service with the Ethics Commission has allowed him to not only present cases before the Commission, but to also argue before the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania, as well as the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court on matters involving the Ethics Act. He's a, he's a 2002 graduate of Widener University School of Law, Wilmington, and a 1999 graduate of the Indiana University of Pennsylvania, earning his bachelor's degree in criminology. Uh, prior to joining the State Ethics Commission in 2006, uh, Brian enjoyed a successful career in both the private and public legal sector, most notably uh, serving as the Assistant District Attorney for York County for two and a half years, where he prosecuted numerous felony and misdemeanor cases on behalf of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Ladies and gentlemen, it is certainly my great pleasure and pride to bring uh, to our podium and to our group today, Brian Jasonson. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Um, hopefully we can give you a very broad brush approach to uh, the State Ethics Act. As the mayor correctly stated, um, people in Philadelphia here actually have three laws that they need to comply with. The first is the State Ethics Act, which applies to all public officials and public employees in the Commonwealth. Second would be the City of Philadelphia's Board of Ethics rulings. And lastly, uh, those falling under the mayor's jurisdiction, um, executive orders from the mayor's office. So although I will be covering uh, several different uh, statutes uh, under the Ethics Act and exa uh, specific examples of potential violations of the Act and the State Ethics Act, keep in mind that there are instances where U.S. city employees may be held to a higher standard than even what uh, the state uh, requires. The State Ethics Commission was created back in the late 1970s in response to a lot of different uh, public corruption that was happening on a national and state basis. Uh, most people may recall or, or at least aware of the Watergate scandal that occurred here in the United States with uh, the Nixon administration and the Ethics Commission was a direct response to that as well as some other things happening here in Pennsylvania where uh, individuals began to lose faith and confidence in their public officials and public employees. We're premised on the idea that public office is a public trust and that we're here also to strengthen faith and the confidence of the public with their public officials and public employees. Let's face it, if the general public can't trust the people they elect into office, the whole system is going to collapse. The last thing we do is we try to ensure that persons, people's personal financial interests do not conflict with their public duty. That's really the meat and potato of the Ethics Act. That's really um, the, the number one thing that everyone should walk away with today is that uh, conflict of interest idea. If you are engaging or if someone has a conflict of interest, First thing to do is avoid a conflict of interest. Second thing to do would be uh, if one is noted, if, if someone engages in a conflict of interest, how do you mitigate that and how do you respond to conflicts of interest? The last thing we do as a state agency is we emphasize guidance. Um, we, we do speaking engagements such as this, educational programs, and we also have an office of chief counsel that can provide written um, advices of counsel 
and or opinions of the Commission to help individuals avoid conflicts of interest uh, through their public service. What do we do? The first thing we do is we administer and enforce the Statement of Financial Interest filings. Uh, most people here should be familiar with those filings. Uh, they are a required filing for public officials and public employees here in the Commonwealth. The second thing we do is we do issue those opinions and advices. So, for example, if someone has a prospective question as to whether or not a certain course of conduct may be a violation of the State Ethics Act, we can provide you with legal, uh, legal advice, legal opinion to help avoid a conflict of interest. The last thing we do is we do investigate alleged violations of the Ethics Act. We do have an investigative staff. We have subpoena power. And upon receipt of a signed sworn complaint, we can dispatch investigators to investigate violations and hold individuals accountable who may have violated the Ethics Act. Public office. Who is a public office? Who is a public official? A public official in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is going to be anyone elected by the general public. Anyone appointed by a governing body, any appointed official of any political subdivision. So specifically here with the City of Philadelphia, anyone that's elected by the public or appointed by, for example, the mayor's office would fall under this uh, category as a public official. Statewide, we're looking at um, township supervisors, school board members, borough council members, county officials, city officials, state representatives, state senators, governor's office. Exceptions to jurisdictions of public officials. We do not have any jurisdiction over members of the judiciary. So although they are elected by the public, judges, district justices, uh, Supreme Court justices, we do not have jurisdiction over. We also don't have any jurisdiction over any U.S. government or federal position. Members of advisory boards who do not have any authority to expend any money and no, no authority to exercise any power also are exempt under the State Ethics Act. So let's look at this for an example. Advisory boards uh, on the local level that we usually run into may be something like a shade tree commission. It may be like a bicentennial commission. Someone that, although they may be appointed by the governmental body to serve on a commission or a board or, or a committee, they are exempt from the jurisdiction of the Ethics Act because they have no authority to spend public money. And they have no authority to bind the governmental body to any kind of contract or any kind of obligation. They only make recommendations. So if an individual uh, may be serving in this capacity, although they certainly want to uphold themselves to the highest standards of ethical conduct, they would be exempt under the State Ethics Act in regards to our jurisdiction over them. Public employees is the second category of individuals that we have jurisdiction over, and I'm presuming that most people in this room probably would fall under this category. It's interesting to note that just because someone works for a governmental entity, for purposes of the State Ethics Act, you are not necessarily automatically considered a public employee. When we're looking at a public employee, we're looking at an individual that's employed by the Commonwealth or any political subdivision. Once again, we do not have jurisdiction over federal or, or U.S. government positions. People who are responsible for recommending or taking official action of the non-ministerial nature. So what we're really looking at here again is, can you bind the government to any kind of obligation or can you have an effect on any other governmental employees or the public at large? Examples may be contracting and procurement, could be planning, zoning, inspecting, licensing, and it could be any other activity where the action has a greater than a de minimis economic impact. Interesting two categories where we do regulate. Um, school teachers are exempt from the Ethics Act, but principals, superintendents, business managers, they all do uh, they all are considered public employees. Uh, when it comes to law enforcement, your rank and file patrolmen, police officers, uh, general, generally your um, enlisted personnel, if you're trying to draw a parallel to the military, are exempt under the Ethics Act. Lieutenants, captains, majors, chiefs of police, they would all be covered as public officials, uh, I'm sorry, public employees under the Ethics Act. And the mindset here is, as a supervisor, or as a superintendent uh, for a school district, for example, you have the ability to affect other public employees through recommendations of discipline, hiring, firing, uh, continued performance evaluations. And because you're spending public money in that aspect or in that, in that job duty, 
Um, you're utilizing public money. You're utilizing authority of office that's beyond a de minimis economic impact. Therefore, you're going to be considered a public uh, employee. So what do we really deal with? We had mentioned earlier, I'd mentioned earlier, conflicts of interest. This, if you can remember these five points, you're going to be able to avoid conflicts of interest. A conflict of interest is a public official or a public employee who utilizes the authority of his or her office, confidential information there of, for the, or confidential information, for the private pecuniary benefit of themselves, a member of their immediate family, or a business that they or their immediate family member may be associated with. I'm going to harp on this and I'm going to hit these couple points and go into a little bit greater detail because this really is the number one violation that the State Ethics Act encounters and the Ethics Commission encounters are conflicts of interest. No law would be complete without exceptions and there's really no good point or no good place to talk about exceptions so I'm going to talk about them here. Exceptions to conflicts of interest are an action having a de minimis economic impact. Now I've used that word de minimis a couple times here already. De minimis generally or does mean of small economic value. Now can I put a dollar figure on de minimis? No I can't. The reason I can't is because there's no specific rulings on it. What I can give you general guidance is um, the Commission has found based on case law that approximately $500 is de minimis. Now, $500 to one individual may or may not be de minimis. And I think there's different factors you have to consider in regards to trying to figure out a de minimis value. We always like to use Philadelphia in an example here where a contractor who's providing a five or $600 gift or some sort of gratuity in the city of Philadelphia, a large metropolitan area, five or $600 may not be that much money. Not that to any, again, one individual, but when you look at the cost of living in Philadelphia, it's higher, for example, than in Potter County. We do have jurisdiction over individuals in Potter County. Potter, Potter County is a very rural area in Pennsylvania. $500 in Potter County may go a lot further than it would for someone living in a major metropolitan area. And because of that, it's unfair to just put a blanket dollar amount or a set dollar amount is what is or is not de minimis. What I do like to tell people and try to give them guidance on, if you're dealing with a gift or a gratuity that someone may be receiving, de minimis is going to be less than $50. Now this is where it's important for me to note that as um, individuals under the mayor's jurisdiction, you do have an executive order prohibiting the acceptance of, of gifts uh, with exceptions to uh, gifts of the city or also um, you know, meals, infrequent meals, cups of coffee, something like that. Those are generally going to fall under de minimis category for the State Ethics Act. But if someone is trying to offer you anything or if the opportunity comes that you may be in receipt of a gift, travel, hospitality, lodging that is in excess of $50, you may want to ask yourself what is the motivation of the gift being offered and is it proper for me to accept this? May I be in violation of one, not only the State Ethics Act, but two, also the mayor's executive order. So per, for purposes of our discussion, I'm going to say 50 bucks or less is going to be de minimis. Another exception to a conflict of interest is any uh, action affecting the same class or degree of individuals um, that includes members of the general public or any uh, action affecting a class or subclass of industry, occupation, or profession. A uh, real quick example of this is I may be on a school board and I take official action as a school board member and my children go to school in that school district. I do not have a conflict of interest because my action does not only affect my children but affects all the other children that go to that school district. That's a class or subclass exception. Same thing as individuals that work for the city of Philadelphia. If you are recommending that they, that the city um, take some sort of action that will affect all residents of the city. Not only does it affect you as a resident of the city, it affects everyone else equally. You're not going to have a violation of the conflict of interest provision. When we're talking about authority of office in regards to a violation of the Ethics Act, again, a conflict of interest is public official, public employee who utilizes the authority of their office. What are we talking about authority of office? It has to be actual authority provided by law that is necessary to the, to the performance of your job duty. I like to give an example here, 
and I'm, I'm going to be cautious since I know this is being uh, videotaped for posterity. Let's just say, for example, that I'm driving down the turnpike today, and I'm coming here from Harrisburg. I'm running a little bit late, so I'm going a little bit fast, and a state trooper pulls me over, and he asks license and registration. And I say, come on, I'm a state worker. We're all on the same team here. Can't you cut me some slack? I'm a little bit late to a presentation in Philadelphia. Can you let me go? Now, I've indicated that I'm a state worker. I've asked for some favoritism or for some special treatment. How many people here think that I've invoked the authority of my office at that standpoint? A couple people? Okay. I think you guys are, are on a higher level of integrity, <laughs> and, and, and I commend you for that. Because I've just said that I'm a state worker and I haven't actually given any identity as to where I work, who I work for, or what my specific office is, or what my specific um, position is with the state government, I don't think at that point I've necessarily used the authority of my office. Now, let's change it up a little bit. Same fact scenario, I get pulled over, and this time, let's say I, I tell the state trooper, I'm the director of investigations for the State Ethics Commission. I am on official business, and it doesn't matter that I'm doing 95 down 76. I need to get to where I'm going. You have to let me go. Now, potential violation, a little bit more, a little bit more hands nodding in the heads. Yes, I, I think now I've used the authority of my office there. I've now invoked my public position, and I think that that's something that maybe is actual authority where I may be teetering on a potential ethics violation. Now, just a disclaimer that did not happen. That's just an example only. Please, please don't you know, go writing to the Ethics Commission and saying I'm speeding to get here. But. Weren't, you, this is a question. Weren't you merely identifying yourself in that situation when the person asked for your driver's license registration? I think if you would, um, yes, if you would just provide them with your driver's license and not invoke your position, my position as I am the Director of Investigation for the State Ethics Commission. I, I think at that point, I mean, you obviously have a duty to identify yourself in law enforcement. Um, for illustration purposes, I think when you invoke your position, I am a city employee with the mayor's office. I am the Director of Investigations. I think you're now getting closer to a potential ethics violation. Whether or not that would actually constitute a conflict of interest, that particular scenario, I don't know. Um, I'm sure that happens all the time. People, you know, ask for professional courtesy or, you know, the, everyone always wants to try to talk themselves out of a traffic violation. Um, I don't know if we would be opening up an investigation on all those cases. Um, I have a feeling there probably would be hundreds of them a month that we would be dealing with. But um, just for illustrative purposes, if you're invoking your office, I think that's an actual use of authority of office as opposed to uh, just saying that, uh, or an instance where you don't actually have authority because of office. you wouldn't say, oh, I'm, a, I'm an IT guy for Hewlett-Packard. Like, Correct. <laughs> you know, like, Correct. The reason why they unless, they have, unless they have the device on. <laughs> 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 it, it's using the authority. I, I appreciate it, Mayor. I appreciate it very much. Um, it has to be some sort of use of office. There's a longer example, but it's not as fun, so I, I tried to use my police example. Immediate family is specifically defined. Again, use of authority of office for the financial benefit of yourself or a member of your immediate family. For the State Ethics Act, it's very narrowly defined. It's a parent, spouse, child, brother, sister. That's it. Now, again, this is there's a distinction here with the uh, executive order. Executive order of the mayor does include in-laws which I think is very important because you can have an in-law situation which can benefit an immediate family member. For example, a son-in-law could be benefiting your daughter. Daughter is a child that is a member of your immediate family. So I, again, would commend the mayor's office for seeing this potential loophole here with the Ethics Act and uh, trying to close that um, in, in implying a stricter standard upon city employees. But for or for uh, purposes of the jurisdiction of the Ethics Act, it is very narrowly defined uh, within these parameters. Uh, interestingly, I think it is important to, to note this at this point as well. Um, in regards to spouse, previously the Ethics Act never applied to uh, same or opposite sex domestic partners. We've always looked at it as if you have a marriage license, then you're the spouse. Um, now that Pennsylvania recognizes same-sex marriages or, or potential 
um, domestic partner type situations, I think it does expand that jurisdiction uh, slightly in, in that regard. Uh, business with what's associated, again, public official, public employee, use of office, financial benefit yourself, immediate family member, or a business with which you or a family member is associated. It can be any kind of business, including nonprofit businesses. This is a distinction um, that we can um, draw to um, actually a, a former Governor Rendell um, brought this issue before the commission and it was appealed to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court held that a nonprofit business can be a business for purposes of the State Ethics Act. Um, another good opportunity here, unfortunately, for me to use an example to try to illustrate this. Um, public, public official or immediate member or family members are associated holding either a director, officer, owner, employee, or other financial interest in the business. So for example, um, I am, we'll, we'll use a local township or local borough type example, I'm a borough council member and I'm an elected official to the borough, I am a public official for purposes of the Ethics Act. My wife is a paid employee for the American Cancer Society. My wife is an immediate family member. She's a paid employee. They want to hold a relay for life at our borough park. And we generally charge for part of the borough to use the park. We charge $1,000 a day or $10,000 for a 24-hour period. Um, because for the 24-hour event that we're holding, we need to have grounds crew clean up trash. We need to have police protection. We want to have an EMS crew there. Um, in, in case something happens, and it's a $10,000 fee, let's say. So my wife approaches me and says, we want to hold a Relay for Life event at the, at the Borough Park. It would be great if you guys could waive the fee because $10,000 is a lot of money for us to pay. So I go to Borough Council, and I tell the people, look, this is a great event. We can showcase our park. We're going to draw in people from outside of the community. I think we should waive the $10,000 um, event fee. Everybody says that's a no-brainer. We're going to waive it. How many people think that I have a potential conflict of interest? Is the potential conflict of interest because the American Cancer Society is a business that my wife is associated with? Yes or no? People are saying yes. Man, you guys are tough. I mean, it's a nonprofit business. We're doing a good thing. We're raising money for the American <laughs> Cancer Society, and you're going to say that I can't do this. All right, I have to agree with you guys. Because my wife is a paid employee, she's an employee of any business, nonprofit business, potential violation of the Ethics Act. Uh, someone would usually ask the question, what if she's just a volunteer? Let's say that she's just a participant in the Relay for Life event. She's not a paid employee. Do you still have a conflict of interest? I don't think I do. I think that that may be permissible. It's something that I may want to seek legal advice on before I engage in that conduct. I probably want to talk to my solicitor or contact the Ethics Commission and get an advice or an opinion of the commission before I move forward. But I think I may be okay in that standpoint. That's the type of example where it's a gray area where it's better to protect yourself than, than forge for, uh, forward without having any kind of legal counsel or legal advice. Restricted activities. Yes, ma'am. Good question. What, what, if, what if my wife, in this example, the question is, what if my wife is maybe a uncompensated uh, member of the board of directors for the American Cancer Society or some other nonprofit? I think I have a violation because it's, she's holding a director or officer position. Even though she's not compensated, I think I do have a conflict of interest. I think that is a, um, a business that she's associated with. A lot of individuals that are actually under our jurisdiction as public officials are actually non-compensated uh, board members. School board members, for example, are not compensated, but they're under our jurisdiction. Certain state boards and commission uh, members are not compensated. They may receive reimbursement for actual expenses, but they do not have any kind of stipend or actual compensation. They're under our jurisdiction. So in this, in this particular example, very good question. Um, you do not have to be compensated to, be, uh, have a to have a business that you're associated with nor, going back earlier to our definition of public official, you do not have to be compensated in order to uh, fall under our jurisdiction as a public official either. Very good question. Yes, sir. Is there a way to recuse yourself from the process? 
absolutely. Question, is there, is there a way that I could possibly recuse myself? Absolutely, yes. Um, if, we're, if we'll stick with the same example, um, my wife wants a waiver of the fee. I think what I have to do at that standpoint is remove myself 100% from the action, from, from the board consideration. I don't think I can approach any other board members and solicit their support. I don't think that I can introduce my wife as a speaker. I think what I need to do is, if it's a public meeting, I think I can still sit with the board. But I think before my wife takes the podium to address the board as a whole, I need to announce on the public record, for the record, this is my wife. She's a member of the immediate, of my immediate family. Um, she is a compensated employee for the American Cancer Society, or she's the director of the American Cancer Society, a board member. I believe that I have a potential conflict of interest. I am abstaining and recusing from this discussion. Please let the meeting minutes reflect that. And I think at that standpoint that I'm okay. If I lobby behind the scenes, if I approach board members, you know, individually and ask for their support, and then when my wife comes up, I, I participate in the Q&A, but then at the last minute when there's a vote, I say, oh, well, obviously I abstain because I have a conflict. I think I still violate the act. I've still used my office. I just haven't done um, the last action of actually voting. So once you identify a potential conflict, you certainly want to, there, there are ways you can continue to serve in your capacity. You just have to use the safeguards of abstaining, documenting your abstention, documenting your recusal, and make sure that those are accurately reflected in the public records. Very good question. Second very good question. Restricted activities. What can't we do? We can't engage in any conduct that constitutes a conflict of interest. That's kind of repetitive at this st standpoint. We cannot offer or no person, this is members of the public, cannot offer or give uh, anything to a public official or a public employee, nor can anything which would include anything of monetary value, gifts, loan, contributions, such that the action of the public official, public employee would be influenced. Um, once again, this is where you guys fall under uh, stricter standards. Um, we are really looking at here kind of like your bribes and kickbacks. You're getting a gift from a vendor. You're getting a gift from a contractor to try to entice you to take official action, to try to influence your official um, opinion, your official uh, recommendation, your official use of office. What we're not talking about here um, are the, the the free cup of coffee that you get. We're not talking about, um, you know, maybe at Christmas time, a vendor may provide like a box of chocolates or something like that. You guys fall under some different standards with that and how you have to deal with receipts of those. But the State Ethics Act is not looking at that. We're looking at cash gifts. We're looking at travel. We're looking at hospitality. We're looking at drinks. We're looking at meals. We're looking at sporting tickets. Receipt of these things from vendors, contractors, people seeking to do business with you through your official capacity. That's what we're looking at as a potential uh, section. It's 1103B or C violation, accepting or offering um, improper influence. Um, the other thing that no public official employee shall accept is an honoraria that's connected with your public service. Uh, so, for example, um, maybe there's some sort of a... So I, I know the mayor was, was uh, or I believe he was at the at a ribbon cutting ceremony. I'm going to use that as an example, not particularly with the mayor, but but yeah. I, I always use ribbon cuttings. And I didn't get the, scissors either. So, the, the mayor attends a ribbon cutting, and he's there in his official capacity as the mayor. And there's certainly no problem. It's certainly expected that our public officials do those types of actions. Now, if after the ribbon cutting ceremony, the owner of the company or the president then wants to give a gift or some sort of honoraria to the mayor for showing up. Here's a thousand dollar check um, for showing up today and, and doing our ribbon cutting ceremony. Something like that that's in connection with public service you can't you can't accept. So if someone if you would be doing something in your official capacity, um, attending a board meeting or attending a conference, me attending today the speaking presentation. I can't accept any kind of honoraria, gift, um, payment, anything along those lines. I'm here as a public official, a public employee. That's why I didn't take advantage of any pretzels. I'm, I'm not getting jammed up here. Uh, yes, ma'am.
is that directing an action or is that allowable because you're not receiving it and there's no direct tie-back? Sure. The, the, the question is, what about a situation where I may be offered a gift or something in, in uh, my official capacity as a public official, public employee, I politely decline it, and then the gift um, offerer says, what if I donate it in your honor or something along those lines? I'm going to give you the state ethics commission's standpoint on that. We believe that is a violation still. Um, by directing where those proceeds may be made or even taking um, credit for, for that donation, um, we think that there's a violation there. We, we did a case with a, um, it was a mayor of a borough, or large, a small city actually, who was doing marriage ceremonies and was collecting payment for those marriage ceremonies and donated those proceeds to 100% legitimate charities. SPCA, American Red Cross, VFW, you name it, it went to 100% legitimate charities. But the problem was the public official would show up with the big novelty check every time he did that. <laughs> and he was buying goodwill. So the actually the, the Commonwealth Court said you cannot do that. So I think in that instance, although we all want to be nice, we all want to do the nice thing, we, we all want to say, sure, if the money's, I'm not taking the money, you know, give it to American Cancer Society, give it to SPCA, or even if, even if the board says or the, the gift giver says, we'd like to donate it on your behalf or in recognition of Brian Jason, State Ethics Commission, I think you're, you're teetering on, you're, you're getting into that gray area of a violation. I think it's getting closer to a violation potentially of the act. I know you get that gut reaction. Well, what's the problem? Don't don't we want to do the right thing? You know, the right thing is to, to donate money to people that need it or to entities that need it, and I agree with you. But I think in that instance, because it is connected to our public service, we have to dis decline it and, and, and refuse it. It may go against our judgment as human beings, but we are all held to a higher standard because we have elected to serve the public, and we need to keep the public in mind when we do that. Very good question. Absolutely. Is it because they've now told you a specific amount? I don't know if the amount even would play into it. I think the fact that any kind of donation would be made in your honor or on your behalf, I think at that point there, there's a, your office is again being connected to the donation. I think there's a violation of the Ethics Act. We've, we've had um, instances where people maybe said we would like to make a donation and if that's the instant uh, instance, I would, I would, my response would probably be, you can do whatever you want, but you right. cannot that was, that was have any connection to me. I mean, they could say, hey, I think you really did something great. Um, say what you say, and then they decide, I'm going to send, because I like your work, or whatever the case may be, I'm going to send $100 to the American Cancer Society. I think if, if you're there in... If you somehow invoked your office, I think a potential violation. Now, where, where this is, is we're, we're dealing with honoraria here. So there certainly are instances where someone may be speaking not in their public capacity. You may be a cancer survivor, and you're talking at a cancer you know, event, and someone may introduce you as uh, a member of the mayor's staff. But you're not there as a member of the mayor's staff. You're there as a cancer survivor. And someone may say, I want to make a donation. That's totally different. That's an instance where I think that's, that's acceptable because we all live private lives as well. We all have private interests outside of our public service. And the commission actually issued an opinion not too long ago that said before the opinion was issued, if they would mention that you work for the, for the government, you're under honorary rules right there. But the change now is that you can be introduced by your occupation or profession I am the director, of the actually uh, deputy director of the State Ethics Commission. However, I'm not here as in that capacity. I'm here as a um, you know dog lover, and I'm talking to the SPCA. Then I think you're you're not under that honorary umbrella. So there are instances where certainly that is acceptable. Uh, you just have to be cautious. Is the donation being made by a vendor or someone that's seeking to have, try to have influence over your position, and they just happen to be at a non-government function, or is it from just members of the general public that want to make it a nice gesture? That feels like a very gray area. I think it is. I think I think if if 
what what you really just want to do is just raise the red flag because let's think about it if someone wants to make a donation they don't have to make it right there with their checkbook and if it's an, if it's a situation where someone is approaching you and saying i would like to do this i think that's a uh, excellent situation where you say at this point i need to seek counsel I, I want to talk to my my solicitor i want to talk to someone in my office before i bind myself to accept it because let's let's face it um, Again, everyone wants to do the nice thing, but no one wants to lose their job or get reprimanded over something. Yeah, so it either. sounds like decline, 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 or just yeah. say, "Look, I can't get into that." The safest. Do whatever you want to do, but I can't be a part of that conversation. Absolutely, the safest thing to do. Again, it goes against our general nature as human beings, but the safest thing to do is is to decline. And if if it's something where someone's harping on you that bad that they want to make that donation. I think then you got to start asking yourself why. why. Why? Why do I have to be the person? Is it because I'm I work for the government? Is that why that's that's being pursued? But always, um, I'll uh, I'll diverge for a second here, and, and, and I hit it hard at the end. Um, we have to watch out for ourselves as public officials, public employees. We are in the public's attention constantly, and if it's not you as an individual, it's your office. The media and the general public right now is out for blood when it comes to public officials and public employees. Um, I mean, let's face it, the economy is still not that great. Um, everyone thinks that we're lazy. They think that we don't work. We think we're overpaid. And we, we know that's not true. We work in the trenches. We know what we deal with. We're trying to do the best we can. A lot of times with limited resources, people work overtime without compensation. Our reputation that we take out to the public and what we do on a daily basis reflects not only our office and our profession but it also reflects ourselves so when one public official one public employee tarnishes that reputation it affects all of us equally and it doesn't matter whether you're local government state government federal government you know one bad politician ruins it for everybody so we all want to hold ourselves to that highest standard because our actions not only affect ourselves and our family, it also affects the people that we work with. So, again, protect yourself because no one else is looking out for you. So make sure, decline, 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 and then remove yourself from that conversation if you can. Excuse me? Would you raise your hand? No. Sorry, didn't mean to start. Yes, ma'am. The question is, would a municipal court judge be considered a public official or public employee? No, they would not. We do not have jurisdiction over members of the judiciary. So they would be exempt from our law. Okay, the, the question was, if, if a municipal court judge resigned over a potential conflict of interest, it would not be under our law because we do not have jurisdiction under under municipal, uh, under judges, under municipal court judges. That would have to be referred to the Judicial Conduct Board. Can we go back a minute to the one where you're at the park and they want to waive the fee? Sure. Um, you said it wouldn't apply to volunteers. That's My wife's a volunteer for this organization. She comes up and talks to you, and she does them and says, "Oh, they waived the fee." That's almost an inducement of them to say, "Oh, you're terrific. Maybe we'll hire you or something." And to me, that would that would be on the other side of the line. So I'm just wondering, isn't she associated with the organization even if she's a volunteer? And why do you come out on the other side? Sure. Um, I have nothing that I can cite you to specifically. Um, I think in that instance where someone they're not an officer, director, or employee. They have no direct financial compensation. Um, as a volunteer alone, I, I think it's in a grayer area. I certainly would want to hold myself to the higher standard and say, that's great, honey, but you go do this on your own and I'm going to recuse. Um, the technicality of it, how would our commission rule? I don't know. I think they would probably rule no violation. But I agree with you. I mean, holding... Holding ourselves to that highest standard of ethics and integrity and saying, well, wait a minute, that is my spouse. They are associated with these, even if it's a volunteer stand, you know, in a volunteer capacity. I think the best thing to do would be to remove yourself from that situation and abstain, recuse. Um, 
legally or technically do you have a violation? I, I think our commission probably would say no, but always, and obviously I'm doing a great job here because you're thinking, hey, wait a minute, how do I protect myself? I, I think the best thing to do would be to, to abstain or accuse. And that's good. If that's what everyone walks away from here is thinking, hey, wait a minute, what are these red flags and how do I avoid this? That I've done my job. I've done my job. <laughs> The one thing I do want to talk about and kind of cover in a little bit of detail here um, is the revolving door. We call it revolving door. I think you guys call it post-employment. Um, is it post-employment restrictions? Um, the Ethics Act calls it revolving door. Uh, it's our slang. What it is is no former uh, public official, public employee shall represent a person for promised or actual compensation before their former governmental body within one year of leaving that position. Um, I do want to break this down because there are some there are some funny animals here, so to speak, when we're looking at revolving door. This has come back on the scene recently because of I think the economy. What's happening is a lot of baby boomers are retiring, and they've held these positions for 30, 20, 30 years or more. They're retiring, and the government's realizing that. I can hire them back as an independent contractor or we can bring them back on a part-time basis and save a lot of money and still get the work out of the people or they have specialized knowledge that nobody else knows and we need to bring them back. There's provisions that you can do that, but there's ways that when you do it, you have a revolving door problem. So it is something now that we are seeing a lot more of and we're trying to avoid revolving door problems because it does ruin people's plans when they think they're retiring or they're leaving service, and they're going to engage in some private enterprise, back before they're bored within one year, they have an ethics violation. When we're talking about represent, it's to act on behalf of another person, including personal appearances, negotiations, lobby, lobbying, bids, any kind of action back before your governmental board. So the problem is, governmental board can be very broad. Now, on the state standpoint, my board is the State Ethics Commission. So I can go back before Department of Labor and Industry, DEP, um, Board of Education, anybody but State Ethics Commission. If you're under the mayor's office for the city of Philadelphia, you're, you are the mayor's office. Now, does that include other boards that are kind of ancillary? It potentially could, but specifically at least the mayor's office would apply to you. And what you're looking at is um, represent can be any person in any capacity. So going back and seeking contracts, going back and representing someone maybe in a zoning dispute, going back and maybe representing a group that wants to get the mayor's office or your former governmental board's approval on something, that all can be um, a revolving door problem. Now, it does have to be for compensation. So if you are doing it on a voluntary basis, not going to be a problem. But it can't be for promised compensation where, well, we're not going to compensate you now, but once it goes through, we'll pay you. Or let's just keep this between us. We'll pay you down the road. If you, if it, if you get found out, you're going to have a problem there. Person can be any, any business, governmental body, individual corporation, union, association, basically any entity, including yourself. And this is where we've seen the spike in revolving door problems, people coming back as independent contractors. So you leave government service, and you're going to come back and do basically your same old job, maybe for even a reduced rate, but you're coming back as an independent contractor. You're representing a person, that person being yourself. You have a revolving door problem there. So... Be cautious of, especially pensioners, people that maybe are leaving and want to come back as that independent contractor status, violation. Now, there are, in the state, we do have like an annuitant opportunity where you can come back on a limited basis. That does not violate 1103G. The city may have something similar to that. But just be wary of leaving government entity and coming back before your same board. Um, the, the board is going to be the one that you're associated with, um, either through an election or appointment. This does not apply to attorneys. We exempt ourselves, like we do from everything. So for, for the lawyers in, in, the, in the audience, um, 
the rules of professional conduct would apply to us. So, as you know, you could work for the DA's office one day, quit, and go work for the public defender the next, and you have no conflict of interest here. Um, as long as you're not involved, you're not dealing with any cases that you were involved with uh, while you were uh, counsel for the for that entity, um, not going to have revolving door issues. Just very quickly, some things we look at that we see most common for conflicts of interest, expenses, discounts, surplus property, um, private business enterprises, use of personal facilities and equipment. I do want to commend, again, the mayor's office. Um, there is a, the executive order in regards to supplemental employment and use of office equipment, facilities, staff. Uh, that's specifically spelled out as a do not do from the executive order, and that certainly parallels the Ethics Act. Um, you know, the de minimis maybe use of the photocopier at tax time to make a copy of your tax return probably not going to be a problem. Um, if you're running off, you know, 10,000 uh, invitations uh, to your garage sale this weekend on the city copier, uh, you're going to be violating the Ethics Act there. Uh, same thing with computers, use of email, um, you know, for business purposes, going to have a violation of the Ethics Act. Red flags. Any action with the financial implication connected with your public employment, any relationship, Biggest question, is it something that you want to read about in the newspaper? If public disclosure is a problem, think twice about engaging in that action. Always seek advice of counsel. Go to your solicitor. Go to your, to your chief, uh, chief counsel's office. Go to a supervisor. Go to somebody and ask, am I potentially transgressing an act if I engage in this course of conduct? Protect yourself on the front end. It's easier than trying to mitigate it on the back. Um, we do offer advisories. I mentioned that um, earlier. Um, someone can seek a written advice or opinion in regards to the State Ethics Act from our office. Um, I have contact information at the end here how to do that. They do have to be prospective in nature, meaning you have to say, I am thinking about engaging in this course of conduct. Will I violate the act? As opposed to, last week I signed a contract with this company. Did I violate the Ethics Act? So always, always be looking out ahead of time. Um, statements of financial interest, I do just want to hit this um, very quickly. They are required to be filed by May 1st of the calendar year, uh, including the year after you leave office. So, for example, if someone would leave, leave office um, today, you do have to file a 2014 calendar year statement of financial interest form by May 1st of 2015. After that, you're done. You're off the hook as long as you don't hold any other public employment or public office. But you do have to file for that last year that you held that you held the position. Where we where people get jammed up over this is they may work for two months in the new year, so they work January, February, leave office in February, and then they have to file in the following calendar year. Even just for those two months, they have to file. Actually, it's even one day. If you hold office for one day in the new calendar, you, you do have to file um, technically under the State Ethics Act. So just keep that in mind. Anyone that may be leaving governmental service, um, you will be asked or it is your responsibility to make sure you file that form if you held office at all during that calendar year. Yes, ma'am. This is a question. So what kind of analysis is made um, from the information that we submit on those forms? I kind of got into a position and I was told, you have to fill out this form. I fill it out. But what exactly... Sure. These forms are a vestige of the 1970s, and it really is. Um, these were meant to be a frontline transparency in government. So someone would say, okay, I know that Brian just entered into a big contract with ABC Paving Company. That's odd because they're based out of Illinois, and why would they be doing business in Pennsylvania? And if I disclosed that I'm a shareholder in ABC, then someone can say, wait a minute, there's a conflict of interest here. They really are outdated because I tell people now, give me your name and the city you live in, and I could Google you and probably find out everything that's on that form. People get really concerned because they think that there's a lot of private personal information on there, like social security numbers and stuff like that. There isn't. Really what they're looking for is sources of income. So are you employed by a company? Do you receive credit from a company? Do you have rental properties? And you have to disclose that rental property. And maybe you're taking action as a zoning inspector or a building code inspector. Um, you know, well, those, those houses all on South 
Street are okay. We don't have to inspect them. And then here you own half the houses on South Street as rentals. That that's really what they what they were designed to do. They they kind of are outdated, but until they change the law, they're still required to be filed. Um, the biggest thing, the other thing people get all antsy about are the creditors because people say, I don't want you to know where I owe creditors to. Again, this is left over from the 70s because back in those days, it was hard to get credit and most people really didn't have credit cards. I mean, my parents bought their first brand new cars, a Ford Pinto, and they paid like, I think, 1800 bucks for it and that was a big deal. So, you know, $6,500 is the threshold for creditors. Back then, that was an awful lot of money. I mean, I have student loans that are 10 times that amount. So, you know, it really doesn't matter anymore. But, but at the time that they were created, that was what it was for, is to try to be that first line of, of, of uh, transparency in government. Right. Can I just make a point on that, too? In the last year, we started putting all the financial disclosure forms online mm -hmm. um, for all of the executive team and some of the deputies under the deputy mayors and things. So those are actually now very accessible by the public. They can go and search by your last name, depending if you fall in that group and find it right online. So They're always public. Records. They're always public records, but now we're just kind of Removing that one layer where people can just go right online and find those forms now. You can go on our website. You can find mine. They're, they're, they are public documents. So uh, just some people are, are, again, antsy about putting down their home address. You don't have to. You can put your work address. That is acceptable. So, you know, some people don't want to put, especially people in law enforcement or um, a big thing with the state is like DPW. You know, they may have controversies with maybe people that are seeking benefits and, hey, I don't want this person to know where I live. You can put down your work address. That certainly is acceptable. And if you would have any questions on filling those forms out, you can always contact our office if, if you, you know, if it's something that we may be able to help you with. Um, investigations, sorry, they're confidential. I can't tell you anything about them. Um, realistically, all of, our all of our investigations are confidential, though. Uh, so if, if we do contact you as a witness, because I know since doing this training, no one's going to have any violations, so you may be a witness only. Um, they are confidential investigations. We do have... Uh, subpoena power and the ability to uh, hold administrative hearings. Final orders are, are public. This is, we're hitting our time here, and this is why this presentation really counts. This is why Integrity Week really counts. Administrative penalty, our agency, if you're found in violation, can order restitution and treble penalty. So that's restitution plus three times that amount plus statements of financial interest, that stupid form that people don't want to fill out, we can fine you up to $250 for not filling that form out. Mm -hmm. Hey, 250 bucks, I can think of better ways to spend that. Where it really comes into count, the Ethics Act can be charged as a criminal violation, and it is a felony. It's um, up to five years in jail and a $10,000 penalty. Not filling those forms out, the statement of financial interest forms, if someone wants to prosecute you, that's an ungraded misdemeanor. So... Has it ever happened? Yes. And that's a heck of a way to get a criminal record for not filling out a piece of paper. So it really is important to pay attention to this stuff because if it crosses that egregious threshold, you potentially could have a criminal prosecution. Don't let that happen to yourself. Um, here's where you can get our contact information. Um, I appreciate being invited here today. I hope everyone walked away with something of value at least. Um, I will stick around a little bit if someone has any questions or anything, but again, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, before you leave, if you want to grab some, there's some pretzels left, there's some water, and please fill out your event uh, evaluation. We really want to get everyone to be back for next year, so feel free to leave that up here. Thank you. Yeah, the